Simple Campaigning, Ancient and Medieval War Game Campaigns by John Graham Lee. Before we get into a review of Simple Campaigning and telling you whether this book might be right for you or not, I would like to draw your attention to the logo down here in the bottom right corner. You'll note it says Society of Ancients. Society of Ancients is an organization, it's a club, I believe it is based over in Britain. It's been around for decades, and right now, what they're doing, and the reason I glommed on to these guys, is that they are working with a fellow named John Curry to make works by the leading luminaries, those, those progenitors of modern-day wargaming, the guys that laid the foundation of the hobby as we know it. Talking about guys like Don Featherstone, Tony Bath, and others. I think Phil Barker might be one of them. Phil Barker, of course, the guy behind one of the brains behind DBA, which we'll probably circle back around to in a minute. They're making those works available to a new generation by digitizing them and throwing them up into Uncle Jeff Bezos' online emporium. I decided to take a look at their website and see what they got, and I found a couple of titles that really intrigued me. One of them is called Strategos 2.0, which I thought was related to Strategos N. For those of you guys that are interested in the foundations of Dungeons & Dragons, Strategos N is the rule set that Dave Arneson played when he was a wee lad in the Twin Cities, and I, I haven't been able to find a copy of it. Strategos 2.0 has nothing to do with it. Strategos is just the Greek word for strategy. And I'll probably be doing a review on that sometime in the future. However, I haven't... It's not going to be a detailed review because it's really appropriate for a style of wargaming that is outside my current bailiwick. As is Simple Campaigning. This is not a book for me. And it's probably not a book for you, but it might be. So let me tell you, first of all, that the link to get this is down in the description. And it's just a link to Society of Ancients. You should go check out their website, poke around. They've got a lot of good stuff. Again, this is a historical. So if you're not a historical war gamer, th there's the door, right? You're already out. But if you're interested in campaigns at all, this still might be worth looking at. Let's take a look at the introduction by John Graham Lee. And this, this was produced in 2015, so it's been going on a while. For more than 40 years, I've belonged to a group of war gamers. I'm a solo guy. I'm out. Well, all right, hold on. Hold on. There may be more to it, because you might not be out. To play any of these campaigns with figures, you need lots of contemporary armies. All right, I'm out. Strike two. Right? I'm not... I don't have a whole lot of armies, and that's the big thing. It's going to be a rate-limiting factor. Now, you could reskin any one of these. We'll just get this right out of the gate right now. But it would take a lot of work, because each of these campaigns is really dialed into the theme and the order of the day. So let's take... Now, as, as you can see here in the table of contents, we're going to do kind of a flip-through, and I'll tell, ta tell you about each of these solo campaigns, more solo campaigns. So there's basically seven different campaigns in this book, and they range from really about the Roman times up through uh, Crusades, right? You've got Crusades, no, no, no. There's another one, the Angevin Empire, and then the 14th century. And each of these campaigns is really dialed into those, those periods. So the first one that we're looking at is called Solo Campaigning. And I, I'll also point out, most of these rules are for... The, the guys that played these campaigns were using Debellus Multitudinus. He recommends you could also use DBA. Uh, you could also use uh, Armati, for those of you that are familiar with that. These are not names that get thrown around a whole lot on... The used tubes, but you should look into them because they are interesting games. Had a heck of a lot of fun with DBA back in the day. It's a smallish game, but it, it has a lot to recommend it. So the first one we're talking about is essentially the Hellenistic era. And he calls it a solo campaign. But a lot of the campaigns in this book are really nothing more than... Well, hold on. Let's back up a step. What do we mean when we talk about a campaign? Right? A campaign, we should get that out of the gate right away. When we talk about a campaign, it's the game that you play before you play the tabletop battles, or perhaps in between tabletop battles, to give the tabletop battles more context, more meaning, more depth, and that allow you to take your tabletop gaming to a greater level. A lot of guys will refer to a campaign as anytime you play a linked series of scenarios, and there is some truth to that. At its easiest... A narrative campaign is literally just two armies fighting, and then between the battles, you make up a story that adds a little bit of context. But there's no real linkage from one battle to the next. 
That's the case in a lot of these campaigns. Eh, kinda, sorta, not really to greater or lesser extent. Remember, I'm, I'm actually reviewing seven different sets here. Going up a step, a campaign can also be what they call an escalation campaign, where you play, you play a battle between two forces, and then they both get a little bit stronger. And then you play another battle, and they both get a little stronger. And a little, right? Or maybe one gets a little stronger and one gets a little weaker. But the outcome of each battle impacts the next battle. We don't see a whole lot of that in simple campaigning. What we do see is a number of different ways to utilize a map and our friends the dice to generate tabletop battles that may or may not have a real connection to each other. So for example, in this first solo campaign, all you're really doing is rolling dice for each of these would-be empires. The little numbers that you see here are aggression ratings. And in each turn, you roll a d6, add this number, and whoever gets the two highest results goes to war with one of their neighbors. Well, already you can see there's two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven nodes on this map plus the Romans. That's twelve armies. Even if you are doing proxies, you're going to want to have six to eight armies. And all you're really doing is saying which city-state is invading which other city-state. And that's all it amounts to. And then you fight that battle. And if the invader wins, hey, great, now he's got two city-states that he controls. And you see who goes on to dominate the you know Mesopotamia and the ancient world, right? It's entirely possible that if India rolls well and everybody rolls terrible, India winds up conquering Rome. It's possible but unlikely. But really, this campaign is just a way for saying who's fighting who. And the only real effect that you'll have based on the winner is if the Seleucids west, take over Seleucids east, you may throw in a unit of eastern Seleucids to help these guys out in their next fight against Galatia. That's all it is. So it's a way for you is to generate tables kind of on the fly. The Angevin Empire is an Angevin. Now this was published in Slingshot 200. We're going back to November 1998. So I am, yes, I am reviewing a rule set that is only published, it's 24 years old and it was only published in a I, I don't want to say obscure, but a, a you know, a, a lot of people know about Slingshot, but it's, you know, the, this is what we do here, right? Joy Wargame, when we look into this. Now, in this case, it says more solo campaigning, and in the Angevin Empire, of course, is Henry II and his sons. This campaign takes place over a number of decades, and this is a true map-based campaign, and oh boy, are you capturing my interest right now. It's a point-to-point -point map, but again, it follows kind of the same procedures as the last one, where you generate random, uh, ra random combatants. Well, let me, let me back up. Each of these particular territories, the guys with the swords, that's who Henry II starts out with. That's the territories he controls, and he's trying to take over the rest of the territories. But he will be comp his plans will be thwarted by the need to launch crusades or by rebellions. You know, here's, here's Ireland. I'm looking at you, Ireland. Although, they're, you know, they're not, they don't start out as part of the empire. Who, who would? Like Gascony, maybe? So, Plateau, Barry, Troyne. So at any rate, these are the lands that he controls, and he's got to be careful because he will have to face revolutions while he's trying to invade these areas. Um, each of these boxes, each of these territories, has a likelihood for rebellion and a prosperity number. At the end of each turn, you will get gold based on who you control, and then you'll spend the gold to try to keep the probability of rebellion down. This creates the kind of game that allows you to have a lot more control over the battles that occur when you hit the tabletop. If you really don't want to have to deal with the Spanish, then you can simply stop. And all you have to worry about are Navarre and Aragon. You know, park a bunch of resources down in these two, Gascony and Languedoc. And then all you're doing is fighting a defensive front on this war while you try to consolidate power over there. And now there's the only chance you'll have to fight a Spanish army. And if this is... When does this take place? My guess is that that wouldn't be a Spanish army, right? Would that be the, the Moorish army coming up north? I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it right now because we're doing a review. But there is an example of how... But again, you'll, you'll have... Let's, let's suppose the, the Scottish start feeling fractious and the Lowlands rebels. Well, now you're going to have to fight a battle between... Your, your Henry VIII's second army, or Henry the Third or Fourth, against the Scottish. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, we're talking about seven armies. 
Maybe you want to have four or five at least. But again, this is a game that you play to determine where the, the, the dust-ups are going to occur. It's interesting for that, and because you're dumping resources in, you have more control over how big your forces are in each of these individual areas. The wealth of an area will tell you how big the rebellion is and how large the forces are that are in rebellion. So you may be caught with, you may want to dump a lot of points into Normandy, you may be caught with your pants down and be fighting a rear guard action to preserve Normandy as part of your empire. It all depends on where you dump your resources. And now we're getting into what I think of as a map-based campaign, where you're moving resources around a map and you're dumping more resources into areas that you want to control and paying a little bit less attention to areas you don't. Solo campaigning across the steps. Now, this is the most basic version of the campaigns presented in this book. And you are literally simply rolling dice to determine who the belligerents are. You, again, you have a campaign map, but you have a simple table. You are going to roll D10 three times. And de depending on which era you are in, you may add or subtract from that die roll. I want to know, am I going to deal with war in Europe? Is there a crusade going on? Or are the Mongols getting uppity? Based on those first three rolls, then you roll a d10 to find out exactly what's going on in which area. If you roll for war in Europe, who are the belligerents? You're going to roll, is it England, France, Germany, the Teutonic Knights, or Bohemia? Right For war in Europe, throw a d6. That's the nation involved. And then, so if you roll England, we'll say, well, who's involved? Is it, we'll roll another d6. It could be Scotland, Wales, Ireland, or France. Ah, that's the other belligerent. So this is one, and then who's fighting them? Because you're not going to have the Mongols attacking Ireland. I, I I suppose it could have happened, but it didn't. And it's not likely to happen here either. The map is a little bit wonky. So really all you're doing is rolling for belligerents and with, with a bit of a, a an adjustment, a mechanical adjustment, so that as you go from the 1220s into the 1230s and 40s, you are more likely to have certain events take place. So it kind of keeps the timeline somewhat synced up with history, but with room for some surprises so that you can have some forces fighting. Maybe you do wind up having Irish rebels uh, go, you know, the Irish are rebelling against the Mongols. Uh, it could happen, right? Mongolia to Russia, Teutonics. I mean, that, that's kind of a long shot, but if the Mongols direct all of their attention westward instead of eastward, if the Khwarizms in, in Muslim India and Baghdad and the Mamluks are, are getting into a war with China, because that's the way the dice come up, you know, you could see these two nations fighting and the Mongols sweeping all the way across Europe. That's not the kind of thing you're likely to see in a normal historical war game, but it could happen here. Again, not likely, but it could happen. And that makes things interesting for you. But again, all you're really doing is using kind of a random determination of who's fighting who with a little bit of a map to help adjust and kind of guide things down a largely historical uh, pathways, if you will. The Millennium Campaign, Europe in the 1100s is another one. And again, it's the same situation where you're really rolling on a percentile dice. Where's the hot spot? Is it in, is it in Normandy, Germany, Spain, Eastern Europe, the East? Depending on what you roll, there are different, uh, different results that come up. So if you have Eastern Europe, do we have civil war in Russia? Always a possibility. <laughs> Relatable. Depending on how you want to characterize the current conflagration. Russians attacked by Polotsi. Poland attacks Russia. Poland attacks Hungary. Poland attacks... There's a lot of Poland attacks here. Any country previously defeated by Poland attacks Poland. Yeah. What is that war in Eastern Europe? Well, hey, we are talking about Europe in the, in the thousands, right? And Poland is sitting right in the middle, so if there's going to be a war, it's a pretty good bet Poland's going to be involved. Now, they do provide a little bit of historical context in, in some of these cases. You've got a crisis in Rome in which you are trying to become emperor. And again, lots of fun little, you know, uh, random tables to drive the action. A substantial invade, invasion. The invaders fight, right? You've got a minor raid. The raiders fight one legion, but flee if you've got a larger force. So, uh, it, again, Wolf in the Fold... This is from Slingshot, uh, January 2010, and then May 2010. Simple framework for generating meaningful tabletop battles. This is about 890 to 610 BC. Ooh, this is truly ancient, isn't it? You know, Siege of Aleppo. And in each of these cases, I will also point out, he includes a, a write-up of the campaign in practice. Hey, guys, when I played through the Millennium Campaign, Europe at the turn of the first millennium, 
this is what happened. The Byzantine Emperor Basil attacked Aleppo. Right? In turn two, the Normans attacked the Lombards in southern Italy. In turn three, emboldened by news in Poland and fresh from his Italian triumph, the Emperor Henry invaded Poland to bring Borislav to heel. Henry died in 1024, and that's as far as we got at the time of writing. I'll also take this moment. I know some of you guys really care about this stuff. It's a simple foldover, right? It's not, not a terribly big book. It's got, it's got staples. Mine are kind of rusty. It's been sitting on a shelf, but that's all right. I mean, it, it looks good. It works fine. The art in this is wonderful. I love, I'm not a huge, I, I'm not, it, it doesn't, you know, I want to see that you're playing the games. This probably wouldn't pass muster in a modern day rule book, uh, but I love to see it. These figures are painted to an average standard, but he's got a lot of them, right? He's making up in quantity what he makes up for in quality, but they look Great. This is the kind of game I would be proud to play. It's on a simple green mat. Lots of great shots of games in progress. You know the guy is doing Look at that wonderful little castle. Henry II persuades a recalcitrant baron to see reason. Uh, the, man. The, it, it, the, the, hey, you, you Brit bongs out there, does Great Britain have such a dry sense of humor because the weather is so wet? Is that what's going on there? And then we've got a wolf on the fold. Like I said, this is, uh, you know, back in the... Ba way back. And then Calamitous 14th century. From Slingshot 2013, we're talking about kind of the, the Hundred Years' War. And it's the same situation. You're going to start by rolling on this chart, Hundred Years' War. Oh, we got... You know what? We got the Hundred Years' War. Okay, great. We'll throw a D6. Did, does England invade Scotland? Oh, great. Then we're going to fight English versus Scottish. Is, is there a Welsh revolt? Okay, great. Well, what else did we roll, right? Each turn represents a decade, decade, and you do three battles. Throw throw a d10. So that's what's going on. You know, one. I guess one way to put it is you, there are going to be three events in each decade. Uh, let's take a look at the horde rides. The Russian revolt against the Gordon Hold, Golden Horde. Excuse me. The Golden Horde attacks Lithuania, attacks Hungary, Poland attacks Lithuania. Oh man, Lithuania is going to take it on the chin either way, huh? There we go. Swiss halberdiers. Oh, we love them. You could use chainmail for this, of course. And then again, he gives you, hey, let me tell you what happened when we did this. The full campaign, the Ottomans defeated Ter Serbia. The Muscovites defeated the Golden Horde, establishing independence in 1360. The English invaded France and defeated them. And then in 1370, the Golden Horde conquered the southern steppes from Lithuania. Uh, by turn 8, let's see what happens in turn 12. The Poles defeated an attack by the Teutonic Knights. An English invasion of Scotland was repelled as was an Ottoman attack on Hungary. Not a bad simulation of the real situation. Hey, sometimes it, sometimes it turns out that way. The French struggled to get to grips. 48 pages. Good stuff. Fun pictures, fun little system. If you've got a large club, if you've got a large collection of figures, and you're looking to generate battles that are, are, are meaningful and have some kind of context outside of the table, this is probably a good pickup for you. As a guy that does not have six or eight armies at his disposal in one single, uh, what would you call that, era, about the best I can manage is, is cobbling together a few armies for fantasy. I suppose you could reskin any of these campaigns from the era that it is designed for to another era, including fantasy. However... Each of these campaigns, and, and this is a, a check in its favor, each campaign is designed and written to reflect the historical era for that it is trying to, quote, simulate, meaning that you would have to go through a lot of work and a lot of effort to reskin it. I don't know that it's worth taking this solo campaign for you know, the, the second and third century BC and trying to fight it out using 13th century armies. Particularly once you purchase this book, if you already have a rule set for the 13th and 14th centuries. Likewise, I suppose you could declare, well, I'm going to make the Romans are going to be, well, in my case, it would be a human army and I'll, I'll make the 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 Seleucids will be a goblin army and in, the Bactrians will be uh, you know, an orcish horde. You could do that. Scribble off and just pen in what you're going to be. So there may be some use in this for you. However, we don't live in an, in an era 
where we are short of campaign rule sets for any given era. If you are looking for a fantasy campaign, it's pretty easy to find one. You don't need this. If you're looking for a campaign for science fiction, they're a dime a dozen. They're all over the place in every different scale. So I, I can't really recommend this for reskinning. And, and also a lot of the appeal is, yeah, you know, this is a really great flowchart or point to point campaign for the wars of Henry II and his successors. Why would you want to mark it all up? So I wouldn't recommend it for anybody but hardcore historical guys, but there may be some mechanical fun that you can do in this, and I may wind up taking some of these ideas. Oh, you know, it's just that simple, right? I just come up with five belligerents, roll three times to see who's where the action is, and then make five subtables to decide what the action is going to be in within those belligerents, right? That's an effective way to do it. Put put together some victory points for each of those wars, and then you've got yourself a solid campaign framework. Um, I don't remember, you know, i got to tell you, I don't remember how much this was. Uh, of course, I bought this back when uh, gasoline cost half of what it does today, so shipping is probably a lot more than the book itself. But would I recommend it? I don't know. You've watched the whole video. If you're a historical guy, if you've got a lot of buddies, if you've got a lot of armies, and you don't want to have to spend a lot of time putting together a campaign of your own, highly recommend this. In fact, you may, if you're one of those guys that just buys these and reads them and never uses them, I would also recommend it. There is a lot of good stuff in here. But you decide for yourself. I'm not the boss of you. I'm barely the boss of me. I'm praying for you.